This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com forward slash about. Welcome to Architecting the Cloud, part of the On Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology, what works, what doesn't, and why. Now, here's your host, Mike Cavess. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Architecting the Cloud podcast, where we get real about cloud technology. We discuss all the hot topics around cloud computing with people in the field that do the work. That's the most important. This is no hand waving here. So I'm Mike Cavish, your host and chief cloud architect over at Deloitte. And today I'm joined by Steve Pereira. And Steve is the founder at Visible Value Stream Consulting, which is a topic I'm passionate about and a topic we're going to talk about today. So welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us what drove you to creating your own company to solve these problems. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. I really love the show. I think you, you've touched on things like value streams in the past, and I think it's this, this topic that's really exploding now. People are starting to realize the value. And I kind of realized the value over 20 years of my career, really. And I could stretch back to when I was making pizzas as a teenager. You know, really, we've got value streams all over the place, and it's taken me a very long time to sort of pattern match throughout the course of my life and find these value streams and see that's what I've been always doing through my whole career was basically picking apart processes, looking at data, looking at measurement, trying to optimize, trying to see the biggest picture that I possibly can so that I don't miss something. You know, I'm terrified of missing something. And I think we can really dive deep when we're looking at tech and we're looking at specialties, the amount of errors, and really, the, the biggest opportunities that we often find are the big picture, right? They're, they're when you zoom back, when you, when you include different silos in an organization, when you really take a moment to reevaluate what all is going on here in the pursuit of delivering value. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. And we forget the more narrow our view, the more we can lose track of that. So I, I just found that, I mean, nobody that I know of is doing value stream mapping full-time in software in the world. And I felt like that was a massive opportunity to make things better and to contribute my history, something I'm super passionate about that also has some history, right? It's got this real legacy that is backing it up. It's not just me trying to throw ideas around, you know, this comes from decades of work and validation. So I just felt like that was a perfect storm and it's the perfect time to really dive into this. And there's a lot of things sort of pulling in that direction too. You talk a little bit about the history there and, and most of, you know, the early DevOps folks kind of got a lot of their thinking from the, you know, the whole Toyota process improvement thing. And I, and that may not be where value stream mapping started, but I think that's the model that a lot of the DevOps enthusiasts look at. So talk about that because some of the naysayers were like cars aren't software those types of things, but there are some parallels. So talk about that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting comparison. I think it's really valuable to have that discussion and that debate because, you know, the more we have something, even if it's something that we can push against, right, we have something to find where we can say, we don't want that. That's not what we agree with. It gives us a reference point, right? So I think I wouldn't say that car manufacturing or traditional manufacturing is a perfect analogy to software, but there's a lot of great examples, especially recently, that are drawing a lot of valuable parallels. Like if we look at Mick Kirsten's book, Project to Product, you know, he uses car manufacturing as the entire backdrop of that, that whole story and highlights areas where there's a lot of commonalities. And I think my perspective on this is that we never want to go full auto with anything, right? If you go full auto with anything, you lose. And I I mean automation, not automotive. But the more we sort of automate something, you lose value because you commoditize, right? You're going to make it trivial to perform whatever value creation that you're doing. And so eventually you fall off a cliff and it just becomes ubiquitous, like electricity or, or whatever else. So what I'm sort of hoping to share with people about the origins of value stream mapping and about manufacturing parallels is what we should want to do is automate all the things that can be automated so that we can focus on the most creative aspects 
of our work, right? The more time that we can make for creative pursuits, the more mental space we can make for coming up with new novel ways of delivering value and maximizing value. There's no shortage of that, right? There's no shortage of abilities to improve that focus because we certainly don't have enough now. You know, we're drowning in complexity. And so we certainly haven't swung the pendulum so far towards automation that creativity is in jeopardy or is in danger of disappearing, right? We have way too much opportunity with manual work and toil to automate things that need to be automated. And I think making the case against creativity in a world where we are mapping value and we're measuring and we're trying to automate, we're not putting creativity in danger anytime soon. We're just making space for it. One of the areas I focus on a lot is building new operating models optimized for the cloud. And and I I think you mentioned the Team Topologies book that you read. Well, it's similar to that, like, let's organize in ways that make sense for the new way we want to deliver software. And what gets left out in that conversation a lot is the process. So, yeah, this team now looks like this, but we're still going to go back to the processes that were built for delivering software in a mainframe twice a year, right? So getting to the question here, the problem is we need to do a value stream analysis. The problem is in some cultures, it's hard to get everyone in the value stream in the conversation. So we start focusing on local optimization, right? So like the DevOps teams optimizing their stuff, but then you wind up with all these teams doing local optimization. So the question is, is that making anything better or worse or could it go both ways? Or you know, what, what do you see when you see that happening? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that it's only natural for us to try and improve areas where we have maximum control. It really is frustrating for us to try and rally against something that is not going to accommodate our efforts, that's not going to reward our efforts that we're not necessarily incentivized to pursue. So I think that naturally the low road is to focus on what do I have absolute control over because I can iterate the fastest, I can learn the fastest, and I can optimize to my heart's content. But I think that's an illusion. I mean, if we go to the theory of constraints, any effort that we make towards not addressing our bottleneck is potentially waste, right? It could be potentially pulling us in the wrong direction. In the context of an individual contributor, you know, if I'm focused entirely on what I can control, I could go down the road in a, in a direction that is completely wasteful to my organization, right? They couldn't care less about what I was doing because it was out of the context of their primary value streams, you know, the primary goals and values of the organization. And so there's this danger of if we keep our heads down and in some cases, you know, we're, our heads are buried in the sand with, with automation, right? It feels good to automate something. I'm a victim of this myself. And I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to optimizing things that aren't ultimately valuable because there's so much intrinsic reward in a fast feedback cycle. And you know the things that fire in your brain when, when you, you build a little toy that does what you wanted it to do, it's a fantastic feeling. But I've also been victim to you know my bosses and my boss's bosses telling me straight to my face like, I don't understand why this was three weeks. Yeah, it's gold plated and it, it, it looks fantastic. It doesn't solve the problem that I have, right? It's, it's not what we were. And, and, and that could be communication. There's a whole bunch of reasons why this is a big mess. But I, I think that, you know, we owe it to ourselves as individual contributors and as leaders to step away and say, what is the main bottleneck here? What is the main problem that we're trying to solve? What's really affecting us? And ultimately, you know, what we're, we're trying to move the needle on is time to value, right? I mean, all other metrics that we care about are really like subservient to that main primary driver that that we need to answer for. If we don't have a good answer for that, we need to take a really hard look at how we're doing things and what we're doing. So one one example of this I see a lot is you go into a lot of organizations and there's a lot of energy going into the CICD pipeline to automate things, but there's, 30 to 50 days of waste before you hit the button and that only gets you to stage and there's another 30, 50 days after. And that's an example where we're continuously spending resources trying to make, you know, a 10 hour build down to two hours, but you can make it a millisecond. It's still going to take you four months to deliver anything. Exactly. So so I think that's one of the things value stream mapping at least points out is not only what is the waste, but where you should start next. So give me an example of a workshop where, 
you went in there and the data was so mind-blowing to the client. They had no idea how bad something was and, and then how they responded to that and hopefully made things better. Yeah, well, I've, I've got quite a few, but I'll go with the biggest, you know, a gigantic Fortune 100 company, hardware, software, really complex environment. You know, they were using SAFE, uh, I wouldn't say effectively, and they so just... SAFE effectively? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Let's come back to it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it in two weeks. Uh, <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> but I think, you know, we had a really typical complex extremely large enterprise environment. And they brought me in because they had budget that they wanted to make a case for. They had budget to spend on DevOps. They had specifically earmarked it for continuous delivery, CI, CD, deployment automation. And what they wanted to do was prove that their hypothesis was correct and that they should get budget for this project, right? It's going to be multiple millions of dollars. It's probably going to take 18 months to two years to deliver let's make a case to get this money. And so they called me in to sort of validate that hypothesis. And it turned out that after the value stream mapping exercise, we revealed that their deployment automation was totally fine. And and their biggest problems were environment creation and automated testing, but a lack of automated testing to be specific. And they just dwarfed deployment automation. So, you know, it could have taken them two weeks to deploy their software, and it still wouldn't be the bottleneck, right? So any effort that they were putting in that area, you know, multiple millions of dollars, months of waste that they could have put towards any other initiative, like something that eliminates a bottleneck, would have gotten missed without this exercise. And a comment that I had from somebody on the team, and I'll never forget this, was this guy had been in the company for 19 years. And he said, after we did the currency value stream map, he said, I've never seen our start to finish process. I've never seen it before. I never knew what went into it. And, and this is after being down the road with digital transformation, agile, DevOps, safe. They still had never had that picture of what was really going on. And we wonder why people have all these failed transformation efforts, right? I mean, how often are people looking at what's actually happening before we strive for better? Do we know what's going on right now? Because I think that, you know, that ultimately drives so much more value than picking something arbitrarily or something out of Accelerate or out of cloud survey and saying, oh yeah, people are finding success there. We should do it. And that I think is just, that's happening all over the place. And people need to look at their own environment before they make those decisions. And I I think a a lot of like that guy's comments are actually very common when you do these workshops because a lot of work is not visible. So you you think everyone thinks they know the process, but they all know it from their own lens. Until you get them all in the room, you find out, well, if Bob's on vacation this day, the process stops and nobody knew that, right? Yes. (laughs) And maybe Bob didn't even know that. (laughs) Right. there's, There's so many things that is out of the picture and not visible. So I don't know if you've seen a lot of, a lot of those examples as well. Oh, it's, it's massive. I mean, every, um, every team that I go into, we have part of the value stream after a current state value stream mapping exercise, we've got question marks because, you know, we chose not to include the sales and marketing people because, you know, I was assured that they're outside the process and, you know, that they're not going to be the focus of this. And that might be true. You know, you've got to draw the line somewhere, right? You've got to make sure that you can't always have the entire company in the room. Right. But whatever you don't have in the room, whatever perspectives you're not including, they're going to be pretty cloudy, right? And and, and cloudy in in the not so great sense. Do you ever have the opportunity to do these with the customer in the room? People probably don't want their dirty laundry aired out, but have you ever got a chance to do a value stream with customers? Not yet. I'm still working on that one. I I think that's the dream, but I'm aiming for the early days of configuration management. If we walk back to, you know, the days of chef and puppet, they weren't worried about competition. They just wanted people to use something. And I'm at the stage where we're not at a level of sophistication that we're bringing customers in. I hope we get there someday. I think that'd be fantastic, really. But, you know, my battle right now is convincing people that this isn't scary even when you don't have your customers in the room, right? I mean, oftentimes your customer is an internal customer and having them in the room is challenging enough, right? Or you've got leadership in the room and that's a factor that I have to accommodate when I facilitate. And I think that's a big benefit to having someone like me come in from outside is we got to make this safe, right? And 
and having customers in the room, having leadership in the room, it could shut all of the dialogue down, right? I mean, it could right. cause people to sort of pull uh, or, you know, keep their, keep their mouths closed when they have some insight to offer. So we don't want that. I, I do hope, though, that this becomes commonplace enough that we have a lot of forward-looking, really advanced and generative organizations doing things like including customers in the room because it'd be fantastic. So a question for you, and a lot, a lot easier for my own. Normally, I know this topic a lot more and I know this one, but do company, sometimes it's a one-time event, but the companies that are really good at continuous learning, is this a thing that they schedule on some basis where they continuously go in and reevaluate and do another value stream? That is exceedingly rare. I'm fighting a battle to get companies to do this for the first time. And I think that making it a regular practice, I would love to see teams doing this every three months. And I'm at the point where, you know, I train these teams to to do it because you don't want to be calling me in every three months. You don't, you don't want to have to do that. That should be a part of your organization right. if it's going to be continuous, right? So I know that the Dojo Consortium companies, there, there's a couple companies in there like Comcast, Verizon, Walmart. They've incorporated value stream mapping into their sort of dojo practice. And they have sort of like a, not a dojo pattern where they bring the team in, although they can do that. But in many cases, they're sending out a facilitator from a centralized team. And what I call this, this pattern is a value delivery team. And it's an enabling team under the team topology sort of structure. You would think of it as an enabling team. But what I'm doing now with large enterprises is going in and setting up this team that will then go in to separate product delivery teams or other enabling teams um, and conduct these sessions because, you know, it, it's not something that everyone's going to learn. I think I've got years of experience with it and I'm learning something new every day. So it's, it's not like uh, something that everyone is going to learn, but I think having people on staff where that's their full-time job, really, because in a really large organization, we've got hundreds of teams. And if you're iterating through all of them, trying to facilitate these sessions, it's going to require an investment, but that's where you really see a lot of benefits, right? Because you can compare and contrast teams. You can share measurements across the organization and say, here's how we're performing. You know, we're working very well in these areas, but, you know, we have terrible lead times in this entire uh, area. So what can we do about that, right? And you can be collecting the learnings and collecting the best practices and, and forming communities around it. And I think that's where I'd love to see this go. I'd love to see a value delivery team in every organization. Have you ever seen clients challenge the findings and fight against the recommendations because it kind of steps on their turf? The thing that can be surprising to people is, I mean, value is is probably the most challenging one, right? You know, when you reveal that four weeks of a process, only like two days of that time are actually value added time from a customer perspective. There could be a lot of value generated from a employee perspective or a company perspective, but ultimately what the customer wants to pay for is really what matters to everyone, right? I mean, that's what's keeping you in business. So that can be challenging. It can be tough to work on estimates. Like I don't really care so much about precise measurements. When I'm doing a value stream mapping exercise, it's best guess from a few people and we'll take the average or we'll take the worst case and we'll throw that in. So anyone who's looking for a definitive, this is objectively the, the correct measurement it is going to be disappointed, but that's not the point. You know, the point is to find a bottleneck. It's not to find out how bad is the bottleneck because once we find a bottleneck, it's so much bigger than everything else. It doesn't matter what the precise measurement is, right? It's diminishing returns, right? So the more precise you are, the longer it takes, the less valuable the actual activity is. So I try and keep it super minimal. You know, I'm talking two, three hours most to do a current state map. And I think that's where we've seen a lot of challenges before in organizations where they take a week to do this and they end up with 2000 steps and eight measurements for every step. And at the end of it, nobody wants to think about it ever again. They certainly don't want to do it again, but they don't even want to look at the map because it reminds them of that horrible exercise. So for me, it's, it's, it's all about making it fun, making it as low impact as possible on the team so that you know, we can point out those risks and opportunities and start fixing them rather than trying to build the perfect map or trying to build a map that everyone is satisfied with. 
So last question for all those listeners who are in one of those bottlenecks and they know it and uh, they're trying to sell up saying, hey, we need to do some value stream mapping and uh, they're not having success. What are some of the tricks we can use to express the value of these things and to sell up and say, hey, we really need to do this? That's a great question. It's a good reminder to me that I need uh, I need to convince your boss PDF that I can send people. It really depends on your level in the organization. Like my primary customers are like VP engineering, right? They know that they're measured on delivery performance. They know that they're measured on lead time. And so their challenges really map well to something like value stream mapping. It's like everything that I'm struggling with, complexity, friction, visibility, perfect, perfect match. In the rest of the organization where they don't necessarily have control over that lead time, over processes, over changing anything, I think an easy way to get started and to sort of sell this up is to try and do the value stream on your own, right? I mean, pick your start and end point. We get requirements from customers or requirements from a backlog, and we have shipped something to customers that they're using. I like to say, you know, the boundaries that I like the most are when it starts costing you money to when it starts making you money, right? And it's easy for people to understand. Map that out from your own perspective, right? And highlight those areas where you see the gaps where, you know, I don't really know what happens there. I don't really know how long it takes. I don't know who's involved. I don't know what kind of artifacts we're creating. I don't know what kind of tooling is involved. You can build a map that looks like Swiss cheese, right? It's just full of holes. And then that starts a conversation, right? We can bring that to everyone else in the organization and say, hey, this is, I've been working on something to try and boost my understanding of what's, what the big picture is. Do you know what happens in any of these gaps, right? Can you help me build up this picture? And that can be kind of the grassroots approach to getting people kind of conscious of this idea because we, we don't really understand that it's a problem until you start looking at those maps and people start asking themselves, oh, yeah, I really don't know what's happening. And the fact that we have complexity, friction, and we can't see things, that definitely seems like, you know, it could be affecting our performance, right? It could be affecting our outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I'd be very curious to find out where we're being most affected by those things that are happening. And I think it can be very grassroots in raising awareness and then having channels where I think we're lacking a lot of content as well, right? We're lacking a lot of talks about different aspects of value stream mapping. I'm trying to generate as much as possible. And there's a lot of folks out there talking about this now, but we certainly don't have a Bible of value stream mapping and software yet that's in the works. And, and I'm a terrible, <laughs> I'm a terrible writer. So I apologize for not having it done yet, but I think you know, when we see things like project to product get released, making work visible get released, accelerate get released, uh, the Phoenix project, people can sort of rally around ideas with the confidence that this is a real thing. We can have conversations about it. And there's a trust that it's a good idea to follow. But in the absence of that material that says absolutely 100% do this, you know, we have Forrester Gartner saying yes. But I think the grassroots approach of just saying, I don't know what I don't know. And I'm curious about it. And, and I think most people will find that a lot of people are curious about it. Once you raise the question, you can't sort of not think about it anymore, right? We're just naturally kind of curious about what is the whole reason why we're doing this, right? Well, why do we come to work in the morning? And that, that's the question that we're ultimately answering with the value stream. I have one slide and I'm not going to remember all four, but like I said, I do a lot of work helping people with new operating models, usually around setting up platform teams, implementing DevOps, SRE. And when you do that, the four main processes I see that, that should change the most and will slow down your acceleration if you don't change it is like incident management, mm -hmm. you know, change management, release management. I don't remember the fourth one, but I have like four of them. It's like those are the repeat offenders of not getting cloud acceleration that I see a lot just in the context of how do we run what we build, you know, in that use case. So if we could make it, maybe boil it down to people and say, look at Look at these few things, and if you're having pain there, you know, let's go attack it. Maybe maybe that's a good way to go. So appreciate your time today. I love this topic. Maybe we'll have a safe conversation uh, <laughs> some other day. Where can we find you on Twitter? And if you have any talks out there, where can we find uh, your good content on this topic? Yeah, well, I've got everything kind of collected under steveherrera.ca. Visible.is is the company website. I'm on Twitter at Steve Elsewhere. And I spend a little bit of time there. It's not really a work focus for me. My sort of work presence on social media is on LinkedIn. And I, I love to connect with people there. 
I'm on there all the time trying to share ideas and have conversations with people. So I would love any of that. Steve at visible.is is my email. And I'd love to hear from folks who listened to the podcast and had further questions or, you know, they want to have a conversation about anything under the sun about value streams. I, I can't get enough. Yeah, me neither. So thanks for coming to the show today. That's our show, Architect in the Cloud with Steve Pereira. To learn more about Deloitte and read today's show notes, head over to DeloitteCloudPodcast.com. You can find more podcasts by me and my colleague Dave Lenticum just by searching for Deloitte on Cloud Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Again, I'm your host, Mike Cavus. If you'd like to reach me, I'm at mcavis at Deloitte.com. You can always find me on Twitter, madgreek 65 Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Architecting the Cloud. Thank you for listening to Architecting the Cloud, part of the OnCloud podcast with Mike Cavus. Connect with Mike on Twitter, LinkedIn, and visit the Deloitte OnCloud blog at Deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.